I'd like to order some food for delivery. It's chow time! What was... What was... What was... What was... Joe Malone, and this is Chow Time! Video review. Each episode, Joe and I are going to be coming right at you with reviews of all sorts of different films throughout history, probably from the 1930s all the way up to the present, we feel like. That's right, right. Joe? sure, maybe even the 20s. The world's our oyster. Absolutely, and as part of our Chow Time review, each episode we're reviewing some delicious cuisine from around the metropolitan area. We're going to be discussing it during the show, and then at the end you can get out the names and addresses of all these wonderful restaurants by checking the credits. That's right, because public access won't let us mention any establishment during the show, which is cool. we got to prove to them we're not out to get any bucks. This is not commercial stuff. You wait for the credits, you find out the place that we're talking about at the end of the show. Absolutely. So we'll be coming at you with four or five great reviews each show, and we'll follow it up with our loser of the That's week. right. My favorite. We talk about bombs! Sucky Fins! Lazarios! Ooh, films is what I meant. Big Trout Fins slapping out! Now, you know we're talking about America, the kind of stuff you see right. on TV all the time. I'm going to be choosing some of these are my favorites, so will Joe. So will our director, Dr. Von Bach. 
Well, that's neither hither nor thither. Let's talk about this week coming at you. First off, we're going to be reviewing Jeremiah Johnson, a 1972 film directed by Sidney Pollack, who most recently did that turkey, the film. Okay. The firm. <laughs> so what did I call it? The film? The film. Sorry, I'm sober as a duck. <laughs> we're going to be following that up with Say Anything, a 1989 film starring Cameron Crowe, who wrote oh, Fast it, Times. Oh, it's directed by Cameron Crowe. Yeah, uh, uh, starring. Directed uh, yeah. by Cameron Crowe and starring John Cusack. In the Eoni Sky. All right, that was right. my choice, by the way. So you know that I'm going to like it. Followed by that is a 1966 comedy directed by Victoria De Sica, entitled After the Fox, starring Peter Sellers. Written by... Neil Simon. With music by... I forget. Burt Bacharach. Oh, the classic Yeah, that's visual. right. Yeah, well, he's a schmuck. But anyway, uh, just kidding, Burt, if you're out there in New York. Finally, our fourth film of this week, not including the turkey, a loser. real nail biter, a nail biter. This is a classic hard edge film. I'm having a mental block. What was it, Tom? Straight time. Oh, yeah, a little-known gem. 1978 film starring Dustin Hoffman and Teresa Russell, directed by... Uli Grossbard. That's correct. Yeah. He's the man. It's going to be something man. else coming right at you. And don't forget that we'll be reviewing Chow Time. Time. Okay, the name of the first film we're going to review tonight is Jeremiah Johnson, a 1972 movie directed by Sidney Pollack and starring Robert Redford. This is a film about, about mountain men. Robert Redford plays a part of a man that just doesn't get along in society. Now the first clip we're going to look at in this film, it's going to show uh, Will Gear, a tremendous actor in his own right, is going to be uh, kind of a mentor for Jeremiah Johnson here in the wilderness. And Will Gear is a man who lives for Grizz. Grizz. Grizzly bears. I ain't seen a live man in, in two months. I am Bear Claw Chris Lapp, blood kin to the grizzler that bit Jim Bridger's ass. You are molesting my hunt. This place has been trapped out since 25. What are you doing here, then? I hunt Grizz. Grizz? Grizz or bears, Pilgrim. I collect the claws. You know how to skin Grizz? I can skin most anything. You sure are cocky for a starving Pilgrim. How should be? Go in, get warm, get yourself something to eat. I've got a chore to finish. Now, boy, are you sure that you can skin Grizz? Just as fast as you can find him. <laughs> 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 Grizz. That's a very funny scene. Anyway, so as the movie rolls along, J Jeremiah Johnson comes across a wife and a kid. Everything's mint condition until a group of white, a.k.a. Honko, cavalry soldiers comes knocking on the door. As Johnson's just put it up the front door, this cavalry soldier white Honko unit is head by Bentley of the Jeffersons, an actor named Paul Benedict. And they, they need Jeremiah Johnson's help until they come across the spiritual burying, burying ground of Indians. Another sect, which I forget the title. I mean, this is a big plateau of, like, bones and, like, statues. And Johnson turns pale. He's like, we can't go through there. This, you can't go through spiritual Indian grounds. So let's check out this clip. <laughs> something? Can't go through here. Johnson, those people are down there waiting for us. Now they are freezing and hungry and scared. Oh, don't even come here except with medicine men and bearing parties. Well, we are not crows. What would happen, Johnson? I don't know. Well, thanks all the same, Johnson, but we're riding through. Sergeant, prepare to move. You won't make it, Lieutenant. What? You have to hunt, you said. I have to try.
Well, we seem to have escaped. Grizz. Hey, you. <laughs> okay, let's sum this up. This flick out, in my opinion, pretty realistic slice of mountain life, but too episodic and dragged after a while. It had a god-awful stinker of a soundtrack, and that brought it down a notch by itself. By the way, I should say this right now. What do I mean by a notch? Tom and I review these movies 0 to 10 with decimal points. No thumbs up, no thumbs down. 0 to 10 with decimal points. Obviously, a 0 is the worst bomb you've ever seen in your god darn life, and a 10 is a flawless, perfect picture. Redford's good, in my opinion. He's a little out of place because of his pretty boy looks, and he's got this kind of cultured image. But he's excellent. I mean, he's a good actor, and he helps the film. Uh, great kooky characters. Grizz. <laughs> Plus, we didn't get a chance to talk about it, but Stefan Girash is a bald guy named Del Q, uh, who's just a nut. Uh, who, the first scene, he's buried up to his neck from the Indians in, in the sun. And excellent, as you mentioned before, realistic fighting. The Over action was true. just like real. Overall, I'd say it's well ca a well-cast picture. If you can get over a slightly pretty boyish Robert Redford in the woods, right. it's pretty well cast otherwise. I dig that. That's true. You know, and Bentley's absolutely. good. Bentley's not like the nerd that he is That's in the Jeffersons. True. Paul Benedict is his name. Uh, just to finish up my critique, again, I'd call it a passable Western, and in conclusion, a pretty realistic Western with decent acting and some damn good, good kooky characters, but dragged to too many points and had a god-awful 70s soundtrack. Final critique. Zero to ten. With decimal points, in JoJo's opinion, five. I give the movie a five, right in the middle. Okay, Joe, we'll discuss your opinion in a moment. Let me just get mine in. Uh, yes, I, you know, it's, it's a 1972 film. I first saw it when I was six years old, and I've never forgotten it. I really think that it's one of Robert Redford's best pictures. I'm uh, sure the whole world will disagree with me, if not the best. Um, he does. A, it's a real stretch for him. Robert Redford, the pretty boy, the beautiful blonde, the man with the golden voice. Here he is in a picture where he's just got to rely on instinct, and he has to have a big bushy beard the whole picture, and he's really not there to look pretty. And I think he pulls it off. I didn't think he could do it. I mean, he really seems like the mountain man to me. He doesn't look too GQ to you with no, like a glued-up beard. No, I didn't beard. think so. I didn't have any problems. As a matter of fact, I think that beard was real. But yeah, no, I think the beard was real too, actually. Um, but. The cinematography is just incredible. It's yeah, filmed, I director like that a lot. And it was filmed in Colorado in national parks, and Sidney Pollack is really on top of all the shots. And the editing is also fantastic. Yeah, very good. We didn't get to show this, but there's a scene, it's not giving anything away in the plot, where uh, Robert Redford's attacked by wolves. Right. And, and that was fantastic it editing. Was. And just as a final point, I mean, I was touched by the character. He picked it. This was Tom's this choice. This was for my, the show. my choice. Yeah. And I'd have to sum it up to say. In decimal points, I myself, I give it an 8.2. 8.2. A very high grade. Yikes. It's got, some, it's got a little bit of graphic that violence soundtrack, in it. Huh? And hopefully Joe, over time, maybe, you know, hey, your hey, viewpoint hey. will change, you know? I don't I mean, want to see it again. I mean, I'm not shredding <laughs> it. No, it's a, we got a lot of movies to see. You know, Chow Time's going to be at you for some time. Okay, next up on the chopping block here at Chow Time is a 1989 film. Say anything. It's directed by Cameron Crowe. But that's neither hither, hither nor thither. Nah, that's, what, that's my jargon. It's copyrighted, by the way, to Joe Malone. But anyway, say anything. Uh, excuse me, Dr. Von Bach, what was With that? Apologies to Edward Albee. I apologize. Okay, 1989 film, a romance film, a teen film, one of the best flicks ever. Obviously, it's my choice. In this movie, we have John Cusack portraying a high school student named Lloyd Dobler, who is a karate kickbox person who wants to become a karate kickboxer the rest of his life. He's got a mad crush on a rich uh, valedictorian girl played by Ione Skye named Diane Downs. Will they meet? Will they romance? Will they mate? This is the plot of the flick. And in this first scene we're about to show, John Cusack, Lloyd Dobler, asks out Diane Downs on the phone. Let's check it out. Hello, Diane. Hi, you called me? Yeah, I read about your fellowship in the paper. Um, yeah, I'm very glad you called me back. Yeah? 
thing that any guy has got to do to make his move, he called her up. He's got the girl, they've been going out for a while, things are going well, and Lloyd is on cloud nine. He couldn't be happier. He's even gotten to the point where he's met her family, and he really thinks he's grooving, hoping for something long term. But the object of his affections, Ione Skye, playing the part of Diane Downs, has gotten a scholarship to England, and she's going to go there and study and make her family proud. Her dad's given her the lean to maybe get rid of this eccentric boyfriend as he may be dragging her down. The father keeps prodding the daughter, and finally she agrees that it's better for her future if she, may, if she breaks up with Lloyd for the time being, the foreseeable future. So in this next scene, we got coming up here, it's known as Dist in the Malibu, what you think? <laughs> you be like one of those guys who hangs out at the AM, PM, gas and sip on Saturday. I don't know, guys like that really know the answers. Lloyd, man, no babe is worth it. No, no. Listen, hang with us, man. We'll teach you Bibles for right, us. Right. Lloyd, man, you can't even trust them, man. Right, because you know what it's man. about? They spend your money and they tell their friends everything, everything. man. It's about economics. Valid, they tell them everything, That's man. Valid. All you gotta do is find a girl who looks just like her, yeah. and nail her, and then dump her, man. Dump her, Get her man. off your mind. Yeah, right. Your only mistake is that you didn't dump her first. Well, Diane right. Court is a show pony. You mean a stallion, my friend. Yeah. Walk with us and you walk tall. Walk tall, my man. Bitches, man. She won't talk to me. Won't look at me. Come on! Christ, Lord, what are you up? Get out of your head, Lord. Chill, man. Come on. He's winging it, man. Come on, man. He's winging it. Dude, I don't even feel that way about my car. He's winging it. He's winging every day. Fucking every night. Dude, name a babe, all right? Any babe in Seattle, I'll set you up with. What to do? Diane Court. Dude, I can't do it, buddy. That was a mistake. That convenience store gag is hilarious. Right. It's a crack up. It's the funniest part of the movie. But is the whole film as funny like this? I honestly can't say it is. One thing about this movie, directed by Cameron Crowe, That's is that right. correct? Yeah is that it's got subplots. It's, uh, it's, it's a love story, yes. Also, this girl's got a problem with her father. The father is played by John Mahoney, and it, it's, it's really it's incredible work. Uh, he kind of gives that aloof feeling of superiority, and he stumbles at times. It's hilarious. You recognize John Mahoney's work as he was in Moonstruck yeah. as the man who tried to pick up Olympia de Caucus right. in the Grand Chichino. He's also recently, like, he's a regular on a TV show that I'm go I think right. is Seinfeld or no, something. No, I think it's, it's Frasier. Big. It's Frasier. Okay, that's right. He plays it. That's the right. crippled father on that's Frasier. Right. Let's yeah. get rid of that Walker show. That's shall how we? you guys probably know him. Ioni Sky, she's just a pretty face. She, it's, she's almost non-existent. It's like she's not there. She does not have the charisma of Molly Ringwald. She's, she's not really happening. She's just kind of like a fluttering flower. Um, overall... The movie did not have enough comedic moments for me. I mean, I know that John Cusack is funny. I've seen him in Better Off Dead and some other works, and I was impressed. In this movie, it didn't seem like he was given enough vehicle, enough enough chance to really show off his comedic talents. Uh, this movie, I mean, it's about an hour and a half long, and I'd say that maybe a third of it is really funny, class A comedy. But two-thirds of it is just like a, a drawn-out melodrama, like a bad episode of 90210 with characters you don't care about. I really didn't see much realism in the picture, uh, even though in a kind of comedy it's not necessary, but it's just there were flat points. I'd say, I see that, I'd say that this film overall on a scale of 1 to 10... 0 to 10! 0 to Parker. 10. I'd give it about a 4.5. A 4.5 would be the overall rating. 
Now, I know Joe is going to leap up to agree with me any second, so let me just take a moment here to finish this point so you and I can both slam it. We can bury this movie. I ain't Hold slamming on, shit, man. You're making it a bag of wind out, so hurry up. All right, at this point, I think Joe is trying to say is that he also has a critique. What have you got to say? That's right. Well, you said 10 to 10 for a third. How about 10 to 10 for the whole film? Because that's what I get it. I give it. I'm serious. I love this movie. First of all, I'll be honest with you. It reminded me of me and my ex-girlfriend. <laughs> that might have raised it a bit. Ioni Sky looks a lot like my ex-girlfriend. Is she I, lesbian, though? Uh, well, that's God. another well, story. I haven't mentioned her name, so mom's a word. Matter. Okay, yeah, that's another movie. I mean, uh, okay, check it out. This flick is great. Cameron Crowe captured the essence of high schools. First of all, one of the best things about this film is the atmosphere. Unfortunately, we didn't have time to show the clips. But there's hilarious stuff all over this picture, in the background, the atmosphere. There's a good party scene in the beginning. I thought John Cusack was fantastic. He portrays someone very realistically, a young high school teen guy. He really felt that way for the whole oh, picture? Oh, shoot, yeah. Sometimes he's a stuttering mess, you know, in front of parental figures. And other times he's like a noble, like, you know, I don't know, a, a hero, a, a hero, a heroic figure. What about Ioni Sky? What did she's great! About? I couldn't really? believe you said that. You yeah. thought she... She smiles a hell of a lot, but that's that kind of teen realism awkwardness. She's fantastically realistic. So you sold into her character. You Big really time. believed it. I give it a ten, Tom. Chow time. All right, ladies and gentlemen, the next film we're going to review tonight is After the Fox, a 1966 comedy starring... Peter Sellers. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. uh, directed by Vittorio De Sica, and it also co-stars Victor Mature and uh, Britt Eklund. Um, this movie is one of the classic Peter Sellers comedies. He uses that kind of camp and those kind of visual humor that you see a lot of in The Pink Panther. Would you agree? I think they're copying The Pink Panther. We'll get to that, yeah. Absolutely, it could be. Um, in, this, in this particular film, Peter Sellers is Venucci. He is the fox, one of the world's great criminals. And uh, what takes place here is the movie begins and he's in prison and uh, he's in prison in Italy and he hears about the gold of Cairo is on a shipment. It's moving uh, towards the shores of Italy. It's a tremendous, you know, cachet of gold. And he gets it in his head that he, the fox, is going to be the one to steal it. So with this incredible camp comedy, uh, what, what's going to be happening here is he's going to be pulling all sorts of maneuvers. He's going to be breaking out of prison. He's going to be donning numerous disguises, which is always kind of a Peter Sellers thing, right? Yeah, that it's is. Like his, I guess it's like his motif, right? Yeah. It's like his motif. He's going to be doing all sorts of different disguises, and the long and short of this film is that he eventually is going to take the disguise of a movie producer. And he's Director, gonna, yeah. Right, a movie and producer. producer exactly, probably both, right. Yeah. And he's going to go to a small seaside village in uh, Italy, and he's going to convince all the townspeople to get involved in his great movie. And, of course, he knows very little about directing. It's all improv by Peter and, you know, all sorts of little humor there. And what's going to happen is he's going to try and coerce the townspeople into unwittingly helping him steal the gold of Cairo. That's right. And uh, that's basically what this picture is all about. Who wrote this movie again? Uh, it's written by Neil Simon. That's, isn't that odd? I, like I had no Italian idea. Movie. It seems like an Italian comedy. Uh -huh. It seems very Euro. Yeah. You know, and yet it's written by Neil Simon. It is a bit of a shocker. Yeah. And the music's by... Burt Bacharach. Absolutely. Very kind of 60s. Jingly wah wah pedal keyboard thing. The burp, yeah, Burbank. the back rack that you expect. Right. Uh, in this next scene, um, <laughs> we have Victor Mature uh, playing a character named Tony Powell. I think Victor Mature is the best thing about this bad movie. You got that right. Yeah, in my opinion, and in Dr. Von Bach's opinion. Uh, he plays a, an aging actor, which he was in real life, which right, is kind of right. novel, he right? He's uh, an aging uh, matinee uh, idol, wouldn't you say? Um, yeah, right. And that's what he was, right? I right. Mean, he's kind of right. getting fat, he's in his 50s, and he's yeah. wondering, can I still pass for 30? Am I virile? And, right, it's like uh, a parody of his real life. So without further ado, check it. Look at those teeth, Harry. Just look at them. <laughs> how many people in the world over 40 can still say they have their own teeth, huh? And how many people in the world over 50 can still say they're only 40? Hello, I want to talk to Hollywood, California, please. Hollywood! I am speaking English. Look at this. Look at this. Solid as a rock. Come on, Harry. Give me a hit this dog. I'll hit you later, Tony. I'm making a call. Oh, that's right. Sam Duffman of Duffman Studios. Just one shot in the stomach, Harry. Excuse me, operator. I have to hit someone. <laughs> you satisfied? Satisfied. Now, will you give me an answer for Sam, please? Later. 
I've uh, got to take a shower. Hello, uh, Beverly Hills 42222. No, 22222. What do you think? I mean, is this Sellers at his best or not? No, Sellers, well, I said earlier that uh, Tony Powell, uh, Victor Mature is the best thing about the movie. Sellers is a close second. Uh, he, he, he makes the movie better, ultimately, although he's unlikable. It's a bad movie. Vittoria De Sica, first of all, I don't know, this Italian spoof humor. It's like supposed to be farcical, but they don't go all out. It's not like Airplane, where it's pure right. spoof, pure thing, but, but they're, they're, it's not serious comedy like Woody it's Allen like either. They're, they're like balancing the fence between the two. It's like a subtle farce, if such thing even exists. And it um, doesn't work. No, so... So, I mean, let's cut to the chase. On a scale of 0 to 10 with decimal points, what would you give this bad boy? I would have to give this bad boy, just, and it's just that bad, ultimately a 3. On a scale of 0 to 10, I myself, Joe, I give it a uh, 3.9. Okay, um, that was, that was pretty, yeah, I'd there. say we agree on this one. It's, uh, it, it's a campy comedy. It's, it's dated. Um, the main reason why I slammed it in my score is because it's been done better, and it's been done better by Peter Sellers himself. The best two things in the movie are Peter Sellers himself, though he has been much better, and Victor Mature, a.k.a. Tony Powell, because he's really playing himself, and he's dealing with his own paranoia he had in real life. Have I still got it? Yeah. You know, am I still the matinee idol, yeah. even though I'm almost 60? It so. should be noted, this is something of a cult film. I mean, I have right. talked to people, uh, right. even mentioning that we're going to review it for this show, and they're like, oh, yeah, I love After the Fox. So. Most people I know who say that saw it when they were young, around that time when they came out, and they have fond memories of seeing it as like but a 7 But it's been done much better old. since then. Right. I think anyone who sees this for a first time as an adult, an adult will look at this differently. That's right. So there you have it, ladies and gentlemen. That's After the Fox. All right, everybody. It's time for our Chow Time Food Review of the Week. I don't know what I like better, the regular Sicilian. Joe, you got a preference? Sicilian. He likes Sicilian. He's holding the radio. Sicilian is great. Sicilian. I know. Well, it's your slice, right? I want it yeah, badly. Please, it's my slice. Let's keep it over here, out of harm's way. So, would you say this is your uh, favorite Sicilian pizza in the East Village? Would you be willing to make such a strong claim? Yeah, so far, yeah. Absolutely. What do you say? On a score of uh, 0 to 10, with decimal points, how would you rate this pizza parlor? Take into account, you've eaten hundreds of pizza parlors in your lifetime. Fact, not fact. You know, what's the serious rate for this? I would give the Sicilian a 9.5. And I'd give Whoa. the establishment, meaning the regular pizza, the sandwiches, which I never had, the calzones, which I never had, and the locale, which I'm not allowed to talk about, a 7.75. And the price is good, too. The price is pretty good. So overall, it's a positive rating for I dig it. I dig it. He digs good it. Good stuff. Well, I have to say, you know, yeah. I, I agree with you, man. Yeah. This pizza is good. This man knows what he's talking about. This is singing.